Chapter 4a Anderson's Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Wright. Anderson's Fairy Tales by Hans Christian Andersen. The Shoes of Fortune, Chapter 4a. Part 1. A beginning. Every author has some peculiarity in his descriptions or in his style of writing. Those who do not like him magnify it, shrug up their shoulders, and exclaim, There he is again. I, for my part, know very well how I can bring about this movement and this exclamation. It would happen immediately if I were to begin here, as I intended to do, with Rome has its corso. Naples, it's Toledo. Ah, that Anderson, there he is again, they would cry. Yet I must, to please my fancy, continue quite quietly and add, but Copenhagen has its East Street. Here, then, we will stay for the present. In one of the houses not far from the New Market, a party was invited, a very large party, in order, as is often the case, to get a return invitation from the others. One half of the company was already seated at the card table. The other half awaited the result of the stereotype preliminary observation of the lady of the house. Now, let's see what we can do to amuse ourselves. They had got just so far, and the conversation began to crystallize, as it could but do with the scanty stream which the commonplace world supplied. Amongst other things, they spoke of the Middle Ages, some praised that period as far more interesting, far more poetical than our own too sober present. Indeed, Councillor Knapp defended this opinion so warmly that the hostess declared immediately on his side, and both exerted themselves with unwearied eloquence. The Councillor boldly declared that the time of King Hans to be the noblest and the most happy period. While the conversation turned on this subject, and was only for a moment interrupted by the arrival of a journal that contained nothing worth reading, we will just step out into the antechamber, where cloaks, mackintoshes, sticks, umbrellas, and shoes were deposited. Here sat two female figures, a young and an old one. One might have thought at first they were servants come to accompany their mistresses home, but on looking nearer, one soon saw they could scarcely be mere servants. Their forms were too noble for that, their skin too fine, the cut of their dress too striking. Two fairies were they. The younger, it is true, was not Dame Fortune herself, but one of the waiting maids of her handmaidens, who carry about the lesser good things that she distributes. The other looked extremely gloomy. It was care. She always attends to her own serious business herself, as then she is sure of having it done properly. They were telling each other, with a confidential interchange of ideas, where they had been during the day. The messenger of fortune had only executed a few unimportant commissions, such as saving a new bonnet from a shower of rain, etc. But what she had yet to perform was something quite unusual. I must tell you, said she, that today is my birthday. And in honor of it, a pair of walking shoes or galoshes has been entrusted to me, which I am to carry to mankind. These shoes possess the property of instantly transporting him who has them on to a place or the period in which he most wishes to be. Every wish, as regards time or place, or state of being, will be immediately fulfilled, and so at last man will be happy here below. Do you seriously believe it? replied Care, in a severe tone of reproach. No, he will be very unhappy, and will assuredly bless the moment when he feels that he has freed himself from the fatal shoes. Stupid nonsense, said the other angrily. I will put them here by the door. Someone will make a mistake for certain, and take the wrong ones. He will be a happy man. Such was their conversation. Part 2. What Happened to the Counselor 
It was late. Counselor Knapp, deeply occupied with the time of King Hans, intended to go home, and malicious fate managed matter so that his feet, instead of finding their way to his own galoshes, slipped into those of fortune. Thus caparisoned, the good man walked out of the well-lighted rooms into East Street. By the magic power of the shoes, he was carried back to the time of King Hans, on which account his foot very naturally sank in the mud and puddles of the street, there having been in those days no pavement in Copenhagen. Well, this is too bad. How dirty it is here, sighed the counselor. As to pavement, I can find no traces of one, and all the lamps, it seems, have gone to sleep. The moon was not yet very high. It was besides rather foggy, so that in the darkness all objects seemed mingled in chaotic confusion. At the next corner hung a votive lamp before a Madonna, but the light it gave was little better than none at all. Indeed, he did not observe it before he was exactly under it and his eyes fell upon the bright colors of the pictures which represented the well-known group of the Virgin and the Infant Jesus. This is probably a waxwork show, thought he, and the people delay taking down their sign in hopes of a late visitor or two. A few persons in the costume of the time of King Hans passed quickly by him. How strange they look! The good folks come probably from a masquerade, Suddenly was heard the sound of drums and fifes. The bright blaze of a fire shot up from time to time, and its ruddy gleams seemed to contend with the bluish light of the torches. The counselor stood still and watched a most strange procession pass by. First came a dozen drummers, who understood pretty well how to handle their instruments. Then came halberdiers and some armed with crossbows. The principal person in the procession was a priest. Astonished at what he saw, the counselor asked what was the meaning of all this mummery, and who that man was. That's the Bishop of Zealand, was the answer. Good heavens! What has taken possession of the bishop? sighed the counselor, shaking his head. It certainly could not be the bishop. Even though he has considered the most absent man in the whole kingdom, and people told the drollest anecdotes about him. Reflecting on the matter, and without looking right or left, the counselor went through East Street and across the Hadley Plots. The bridge leading to Palace Square was not to be found. Scarcely trusting his senses, the nocturnal wanderer discovered a shallow piece of water, and here fell in with two men who very comfortably were rocking to and fro in a boat. Does your honor want to cross the ferry to the home? They asked. Across to the home? said the counselor, who knew nothing of the age in which he at that moment was. No, I am going to Christianshafen, to Little Market Street. Both men stared at him in astonishment. Only just tell me where the bridge is, said he. It is really unpardonable that there are no lamps here, and it is as dirty as if one had to wade through a morass. The longer he spoke with the boatman, the more unintelligible did their language become to him. "'I don't understand your Bornholmish dialect,' said he at last, angrily, and turning his back upon them. He was unable to find the bridge. There was no railway either. "'It is really disgraceful what a state this place is in,' muttered he to himself. Never had his age, with which, however, he was always grumbling, seemed so miserable as on this evening. I'll take a hackney coach, thought he. But where are the hackney coaches? None was to be seen. I must go back to the new market. There, it is to be hoped, I shall find some coaches. For if I don't, I shall never get safe to Christianshafen. So off he went in the direction of East Street, and had nearly got to the end of it when the moon shone forth. God bless me! What wooden scaffolding is that which they have set up there? cried he involuntarily, as he looked at East Gate, which in those days was at the end of East Street. He found, however, a little side door open, 
And through this he went, and stepped into our new market of the present time. It was a huge desolate plain. Some wild bushes stood up here and there, while across the field flowed a broad canal or river. Some wretched hovels for the Dutch sailors, resembling great boxes, and after which the place was named, lay about in confused disorder on the opposite bank. I either behold a Fata Morgana, or I am regularly tipsy, whimpered out the counselor. But what is this? He turned round anew, firmly convinced that he was seriously ill. He gazed at the street formerly so well known to him, and now so strange in appearance, and looked at the houses more attentively. Most of them were of wood, slightly put together, and many had a thatched roof. No, I am far from well, sighed he, and yet I drank only one glass of punch. But I cannot suppose it. It was too really very wrong to give us punch and hot salmon for supper. I shall speak about it at the first opportunity. I have a half mind to go back again and say what I suffer. Oh, no, that would be too silly. And heaven only knows if they are up still. He looked for the house, but it had vanished. It is really dreadful, groaned he with increasing anxiety. I cannot recognize East Street again. There is not a single decent shop from one end to the other. Nothing but wretched huts can I see anywhere. Just as if I were at Ringstead. Oh, I am ill. I can scarcely bear myself any longer. Where the deuce can the house be? It must be here on this very spot. Yet there is not the slightest idea of resemblance. To such a degree has everything changed this night. At all events, here are some people up and stirring. Oh, oh, I am certainly very ill. He now hit upon a half-open door, through a chink of which a faint light shone. It was a sort of hostelry of those times, a kind of public house. The room had some resemblance to the clay-floored halls in Holstein. A pretty numerous company consisting of seamen, Copenhagen burghers, and a few scholars sat here in deep converse over their pewter cans and gave little heed to the person who entered. By your leave, said the counselor to the hostess, who came bustling towards him. I felt so queer all of a sudden. Would you have the goodness to send for a hackney coach to take me to Christianshafen? The woman examined him with eyes of astonishment and shook her head. She then addressed him in German. The counselor thought he did not understand Danish and therefore repeated his wish in German. This, in connection with his costume, strengthened the good woman in the belief that he was a foreigner. That he was ill, she comprehended directly, so she brought him a pitcher of water, which tasted certainly pretty strong of the sea, although it had been fetched from the well. The counselor supported his head on his hand, drew a long breath, and thought over all the wondrous things he saw around him. Is this the daily news of the evening? he asked mechanically as he saw the hostess push aside a large sheet of paper. The meaning of this counselorship query remained, of course, a riddle to her, yet she handed him the paper without replying. It was a coarse woodcut representing a splendid meteor as seen in the town of Cologne, which was to be read below in bright letters. This is very old, said the counselor whom this piece of antiquity began to make considerably more cheerful. Pray, how did you come into possession of this rare print? It, it's extremely interesting, although the whole is a mere fable. Such meteorous appearances are to be explained in this way, that they are the reflections of the aurora borealis, and it is highly probable they are caused principally by electricity. 
Those persons who were sitting nearest him and heard his speech stared at him in wonderment. And one of them rose, took off his hat respectfully, and said with a serious countenance, You are no doubt a very learned man, monsieur. Oh, no, answered the counselor. I can only join in conversation on this topic and on that, as indeed one must do according to the demands of the world at present. Modestia is a fine virtue, continued the gentleman. However, as to your speech, I must say, mihi sicus editor, yet I am willing to suspend my judicium. May I ask with whom I have the pleasure of speaking? asked the counselor. I am a bachelor in theologia, answered the gentleman with a stiff reverence. This reply fully satisfied the counselor. The title suited the dress. He is certainly, thought he some village schoolmaster, some queer old fellow such as one still often meets with in Jutland. This is no locus docendi, it is true, began the clerical gentleman. Yet I beg you earnestly to let us profit of your learning. Your reading in the ancients is sine dubio of vast extent. Oh yes, I read something, to be sure, replied the counselor. I like reading all useful works, but I do not, on that account, despise the modern ones. Tis only the unfortunate tales of everyday life that I cannot bear. We have enough and more than enough such in reality. Tales of everyday life? said our bachelor inquiringly. I mean those newfangled novels, twisting and writhing themselves in the dust of commonplace, which also expect to find a reading public. Oh, exclaimed the clerical gentleman, smiling. There is much wit in them. Besides, they are read at court. The king likes the history of Sir Ifden and Sir Gaudian particularly, which treats of King Arthur and his knights of the round table. He has more than once joked about it with his high vassals. I have not read that novel, said the counselor. It must be quite a new one that Heiberg has published lately. No, answered the theologian of the time of King Hans. That book is not written by a Heiberg, but was imprinted by Godfrey von Gehmen. Oh, is that the author's name? said the counselor. It is a very old name, and as well as I recollect, he was the first printer that appeared in Denmark. Yes, he is our first printer, replied the clerical gentleman hastily. So far all went on well. Some one of the worthy burghers now spoke of the dreadful pestilence that had raged in the country a few years back, meaning that of 1484. The counselor imagined it was the cholera that was meant, which people made so much fuss about. And the discourse passed off satisfactorily enough. The War of the Buccaneers of 1490 was so recent that it could not fail being alluded to. The English pirates had, they said, most shamefully taken their ships while in the roadstead, and the counselor before whose eyes the hero-static event of 1801 still floated vividly, agreed entirely with the others in abusing the rascally English. With other topics he was not so fortunate. Every moment brought about some new confusion and threatened to become a perfect babble. For the worthy bachelor was really too ignorant and the simplest observations of the counselor sounded to him too daring and fantastical. They looked at one another from the crown of the head to the soles of the feet, and when matters grew too high a pitch, then the bachelor talked in Latin, in the hope of being better understood, but it was of no use after all. "'What's the matter?' asked the hostess, plucking the counselor by the sleeve, and now his recollection returned for in the course of the conversation he had entirely forgotten all that had preceded it. Merciful God, where am I? exclaimed he in agony. And while he so thought, all his ideas and feelings of overpowering dizziness, against which he struggled with the utmost power of desperation, encompassed him with renewed force. Let us drink Clara the mead and bring them beer, shouted one of the guests. 
and you shall drink with us. Two maidens approached. One wore a cap of two staring colors, denoting the class of persons to which she belonged. They poured out the liquor and made the most friendly gesticulations, while a cold perspiration trickled down the back of the poor counselor. What's to be the end of this? What's to become of me? groaned he. But he was forced, in spite of his opposition, to drink with the rest. They took hold of the worthy man, who, hearing on every side that he was intoxicated, did not in the least doubt the truth of this certainly not very polite assertion. But on the contrary, he implored the ladies and gentlemen present to procure him a hackney coach. They, however, imagined he was talking Russian. Never before, he thought, had he been in such a coarse and ignorant company. One might almost fancy the people had turned heathens again. It is the most dreadful moment of my life. The whole world is leagued against me. But suddenly it occurred to him that he might stoop down under the table and then creep unobserved out of the door. He did so. But just as he was going, the others remarked what he was about. They laid hold of him by the legs, and now, happily for him, off fell his fatal shoes, and with them the charm was at an end. The counselor saw quite distinctly before him a lantern burning, and behind us a large handsome house. All seemed to him in proper order as usual. It was East Street, splendid and elegant as we now see it. He lay with his feet towards a doorway, and exactly opposite sat the watchman asleep. Gracious heaven, said he, have I lain here in the street and dreamed? Yes, tis East Street. How splendid and light it is. But really it is terrible. What an effect that one glass of punch must have had on me. Two minutes later he was sitting in a hackney coach and driving to Frederickshafen. He thought of the distress and agony he had endured and praised from the very bottom of his heart the happy reality of our own time, which, with all its deficiencies, is yet much better than that in which, so much against his inclination, he had lately been. Part 3. The Watchman's Adventure Why, there is a pair of galoshes as sure as I'm alive, said the watchman, awakening from a gentle slumber. They belong no doubt to the lieutenant who lives over there. They lie close to the door. The worthy man was inclined to ring and deliver them at the house, for there was still a light in the window, but he did not like disturbing the other people in their beds, and so very considerately he left the matter alone. Such a pair of shoes must be very warm and comfortable, said he. The leather is so soft and supple. They fitted his feet as though they had been made for him. Tis a curious world we live in, continued he, soliloquizing. There is the lieutenant now, who might go quietly to bed if he chose, where no doubt he could stretch himself at his ease. But does he do it? No. He saunters up and down his room, because, probably, he has enjoyed too many of the good things of this world at his dinner. That's a happy fellow. He has neither an infirm mother, nor a whole troop of everlastingly hungry children to torment him. Every evening he goes to a party where his nice supper costs him nothing. Would to heaven I could but change with him. How happy should I be, while expressing his wishes, the charm of the shoes, which he had put on, began to work. The watchman entered into the being and nature of the lieutenant. He stood in the handsomely furnished apartment and held between his fingers a small sheet of rose-colored paper on which some verses were written, written indeed by the officer himself. For who has not at least once in his life had a lyrical moment? And if one then marks down one's thoughts, poetry is produced. But here was written, Oh, were I rich! 
oh, were I rich, such was my wish, yea, such, when hardly three feet high, I longed for much. Oh, were I rich, an officer were I, with sword and uniform and plume so high, and the time came, an officer was I. But yet I grew not rich, alas, poor me, have pity thou, who all man's wants dost see. I sat one evening sunk in dreams of bliss. A maid of seven years old gave me a kiss. I at that time was rich in posy, and tales of old, though poor as poor could be. But all she asked for was this posy. Then was I rich, but not in gold, poor me. As thou dost know, who all men's hearts canst see. Oh, were I rich, oft asked I for this boon, the child grew up to womanhood full soon. She is so pretty, clever, and so kind, oh, did she know what's hidden in my mind, a tale of old, would she to me were kind. But I am condemned to silence, oh, poor me, as thou dost know, who all men's hearts canst see. Oh, were I rich in calm and peace of mind, my grief you then would not hear written find. O oh, thou, to whom I do my heart devote, O oh, read this page of glad days now remote, a dark, dark tale which I tonight devote. Dark is the future now, alas, poor me, have pity thou, who all men's pains dost see. Such verses as these people write when they are in love. But no man in his senses ever thinks of printing them. Here, one of the sorrows of life, in which there is real poetry, gave itself vent. Not that barren grief, which the poet may only hint at, but never depict in its detail, misery and want. That animal necessity, in short, to snatch at least at the fallen leaf of the breadfruit tree, if not at the fruit itself. The higher the position in which one finds oneself transplanted, the greater is the suffering. Every day necessity is the stagnant pool of life. No lovely pictures reflects itself therein. Lieutenant, love, and lack of money. That is a symbolic triangle, or much the same as the half of the shattered die of fortune. This the lieutenant felt most poignantly. And this was the reason he leant his head against the window and sighed so deeply. The poor watchman out there in the street is far happier than I. He knows not what I term privation. He has a home, a wife, and children who weep with him over his sorrows, who rejoice with him when he is glad. Oh, far happier were I, could I exchange with him my being, with his desires and with his hopes, perform the weary pilgrimage of life. Oh, he is a hundred times happier than I. In the same moment, the watchman was again watchman. It was the shoes that caused the metamorphosis by means of which, unknown to himself, he took upon him the thoughts and feelings of the officer. But, as we have just seen, he felt himself in his new situation much less contented, and now preferred the very thing which but some minutes before he had rejected. So then the watchman was again watchman. That was an unpleasant dream, said he, but was droll enough altogether. I fancied that I was the lieutenant over there, and yet the thing was not very much to my taste after all. I missed my good old mother and dear little ones, who almost tear me to pieces for sheer love. He seated himself once more and nodded. The dream continued to haunt him, for he still had the shoes on his feet. A falling star shone in the dark firmament. There falls another star, said he. But what does it matter? There are always enough left. I should not much mind examining the little glimmering things somewhat nearer, especially the moon, for that would not slip so easily through a man's fingers. When we die, 
So at least says the student for whom my wife does the washing. We shall fly about as light as a feather from one such star to the other. That, of course, not true, but twould be pretty enough if it were so. If I could but take a leap up there, my body might stay here on the steps for what I care. Behold, there are certain things in the world to which one ought never to give utterance except with the greatest caution, but doubly careful must one be when we have the shoes of fortune on our feet. Now just listen to what happened to the watchman. As to ourselves, we all know the speed produced by the employment of steam. We have experienced it either on railroads or in boats crossing the sea, but such a flight is like the traveling of a sloth in comparison to the velocity with which light moves. It flies 19 million times faster than the best racehorse, and yet electricity is quicker still. Death is an electric shock which our heart receives. The freed soul soars upward on the wings of electricity. The sun's light wants eight minutes and some seconds to perform a journey of more than 20 million of our Danish miles. Born by electricity, the soul wants even some minutes less to accomplish the same flight. To it, the space between the heavenly bodies is not greater than the distance between the homes of our friends in town is for us, even if they live a short way from each other. Such an electric shock in the heart, however, costs us the use of the body here below. Unless, like the watchman of East Street, we happen to have on the shoes of fortune. In a few seconds, the watchman had done the 52,000 of our miles up to the moon, which, as everyone knows, was formed out of matter much lighter than our Earth, and is, so we should say, as soft as newly fallen snow. He found himself on one of the many circumjacent mountain ridges with which we are acquainted by means of Dr. Madler's map of the moon. Within, down it sunk perpendicularly into a cauldron, about a Danish mile in depth, while below lay a town whose appearance we can in some measure realize to ourselves by beating the white of an egg into a glass of water. The matter of which it was built was just as soft and formed similar towers with domes and pillars, transparent and rocking in thin air, while above his head our earth was rolling like a large fiery ball. He perceived immediately a quantity of beings who were certainly what we call men, yet they looked different to us. A far more correct imagination than that of the pseudo Herschel had created them, and if they had been placed in rank and file and copied by some skillful painter's hand, one would, without doubt, have exclaimed involuntarily, What a beautiful arabesque! They had a language, too. But surely nobody can expect that the soul of the watchman should understand it. Be that as it may, it did comprehend it. For in our souls there germinate far greater powers than we poor mortals, despite all our cleverness, have any notion of. Does she not show us, she, the queen in the land of enchantment, her astounding dramatic talent in all our dreams? There every acquaintance appears and speaks upon the stage, so entirely in character, and with the same tone of voice, that none of us, when away, were able to imitate it. How can she recall persons to our mind, of whom we have not thought for years? when suddenly they step forth, every inch a man, resembling the real personages, even to the finest features, and become the heroes or heroines of our world of dreams. In reality, such remembrances are rather unpleasant. Every sin, every evil thought, may, like a clock with alarm or chimes, be repeated at pleasure. Then the question is, if we can trust ourselves, to give an account of every unbecoming word in our heart and on our lips. The watchman's spirit understood the language of the inhabitants of the moon pretty well. The Selenites disputed variously about our earth, and expressed their doubts if it could be inhabited. 
The air, they said, must certainly be too dense to allow any rational dweller in the moon the necessary free respiration. They considered the moon alone to be inhabited. They imagined it was the real heart of the universe or planetary system on which the genuine cosmopolites or citizens of the world dwelt. What strange things, men, No. What strange things Selenites sometimes take into their heads. About politics they had a good deal to say, but little Denmark must take care what it is about and not run counter to the moon, that great realm that might in all ill humor bestir itself and dash down a hailstorm in our faces or force the Baltic to overflow the sides of its gigantic basin. We will therefore not listen to what was spoken and on no condition run in the possibility of telling tales out of school, but we will rather proceed like good quiet citizens to East Street and observe what happened meanwhile to the body of the watchman. He sat lifeless on the steps. The morning star, that is to say, the heavy wooden staff, headed with iron spikes, and which nothing else in common with its sparkling brother in the sky, had glided from his hand. While his eyes were fixed with glassy stare on the moon, looking for the good old fellow of a spirit which still haunted it. What's the hour, watchman? asked a passerby. But when the watchman gave no reply, the merry roisterer, who was now returning home from a noisy drinking bout, took it into his head to try what a tweak of the nose would do, on which the supposed sleeper lost his balance. The body lay motionless, stretched out on the pavement. The man was dead. When the patrol came up, all his comrades, who comprehended nothing of the whole affair, were seized with a dreadful fright, for dead he was, and he remained so. The proper authorities were informed of the circumstance. People talked a good deal about it, and in the morning the body was carried to the hospital. Now that would be a very pretty joke if the spirit, when it came back and looked for the body in East Street, were not able to find one. No doubt it would, in its anxiety, run off to the police, and then to the hue and cry office, to announce that the finder will be handsomely rewarded, and at last away to the hospital. Yet we may boldly assert that the soul is shrewdest when it shakes off every fetter and every sort of leading string. The body only makes it stupid. The seemingly dead body of the watchman wandered, as we have said, to the hospital where it was brought into the general viewing room, and the first thing that was done here was naturally to pull off the galoshes. When the spirit that was merely gone out on adventures must have returned with quickness of lightning to its earthly tenement, it took its direction towards the body in a straight line, and a few seconds after, life began to show itself in the man. He asserted that the preceding night had been the worst that ever the malice of fate had allotted him. He would not for two silver marks again go through what he had endured while moon-stricken. But now, however, it was over. The same day he was discharged from the hospital as perfectly cured. But the shoes, meanwhile, remained behind. End of the Shoes of Fortune Chapter 4A